Hello, fellow comic book fiends. It's Sleepy Reader, aka Damien, and this is going to be yet another comic book countdown. My comic book, my thoughts on the comic books that I bought this past Wednesday. What Wednesday was it? I can't even remember. I'll put it in the description. It was sometime in, in March. As I record this, this is Tuesday, so uh, tomorrow I'll be picking up more new comics. I don't know how many. Um, I ended up going to, I went to a comic book store on Wednesday and I showed you guys the stuff I picked up there, but I ended up going to another comic book shop on Thursday and I picked up even more comics. So ultimately I have a stack of 11 comics from last Wednesday that I'm going to rank in my ordering. <laughs> I'm still kind of feeling like I'm finding some good comics, but I haven't hit on like enough great comics. Uh, there's a certain threshold, I guess, where you get more excited to pick up uh, new comics all the time. And I feel like I'm not there yet. Maybe I'm just finally too old for the new comic book game. We'll see. I don't know. I'm, that's just a thought that's passed through my head. I don't want to admit to being too old for sure. Um, so in at number 11, and I definitely did not enjoy much of this comic, Pop's Chocolate Shop of Horrors. It was pretty much close to, you know, wasting the time that it took me to read it. Um, uh, I kind of, since I was doing this countdown, I basically, and plus I'd paid for it. I felt like I ought to give it a try, but, um, uh, you could discount this because I did start skimming, um, in in these stories but it it just seemed like both the, well the writing was just it didn't even though this is archie i've read archie stories that are so much better <laughs> than these just they don't have to be complex or anything but just a little more finesse to them or something um uh, these were very flat little horror stories um it was fun having the devil come try to take tempt pop um into making a deal with him but other than that i didn't i didn't really get much out of this so i shouldn't even talk about it any further in at number 10 little black book i think this is the same writer that did um or what was it called like it was based on beowulf it was called like grendel kentucky or something and that was kind of a cool book this one feels more like a straight ahead movie pitch and um you know it kind of has the art you might suspect that they would use in a straight ahead movie pitch kind of comic it's it does the job it looks okay but there's something sort of flat and lifeless about it and the story itself is kind of a cool movie pitch it's not that bad um you know, this guy who's been estranged from his father after he inherits his father's house finds the black book of the father's connections. Uh, the father was perhaps some kind of Texas version of a mafiosa or something. I don't know. And so um, something comes up with his wife, a problem with his wife um, that they don't want the police to find out about. He calls someone in his little black book and they take care of the problem. So what what will the cost of all of this be? I think initially I picked it up because of the Francavia cover and just because I wanted to try more number ones. Um, but I, I, it wouldn't hurt me to read more of this, but it wouldn't, uh, it's not important to me to read more of this. Um, might be more something to just, if you didn't have anything else to read, to read. Um, in a way I was, I had high expectations for whatever reason for this, uh, apes issue of, um, this one shot apes, ape, apes of April, I guess, even though it's not April yet, uh, from DC. And DC does have a lot of history with great ape stories and ape characters. And at the back, they have a gallery of some of their fun ape covers. I believe in the 60s, there was a theory uh, in the DC offices that if you put an ape on the cover, that uh, the sales would go up. Um, I don't think that's true now, although I bought it because there were apes on the cover. And so there was a not a, a not great but not terrible story where a bunch of apes joined together in a evil team. 
of apes and then a bunch of ape based characters including this new superhero the um what's he called the the monkey prince i think that's a new character that dc was trying to push a while back um whose power is that his limbs can leave his body and go do things um so anyway he teams up with sam simeon and and bobo the uh what's he called detective chimp and the art is almost good <laughs> and uh the story is almost good it just doesn't quite all click together the elements there then the art then there's two more shorter stories afterwards and the, there's really cool art uh in this story by the art by phil hester uh which i really enjoyed the art and the story was okay it, it was very kind of pat and just so by the end um it's written by josh hale fialkov who i haven't seen in comics in a number of years he did a bunch of good stuff at dc and in, at indie comics like i think he was working with oni for a while and then we get a, another story about the monkey prince which is a little bit of a follow-up of the first story and so it, it made me think maybe the point of this maybe is to bring some attention to Monkey Prince, this character that um, that they have recently created. I don't know if Monkey Prince still has his own title or if that already ended. But um, yeah, I could have lived without it, but it was okay. Um, same with Man's Best Friend, another animal-themed thing. I think what... The reason I picked it up and the reason I enjoyed it was because of the art of Jesse Lonergan, who I I learned uh, about originally from Scott here on YouTube. And I really liked, he did a one shot at Image and he self-published some interesting comics. Um, <clears throat> here it's a rather garbled story about some animals on a spaceship who have to save the day when something happens to the humans and uh yeah i just thought the writing was confused <laughs> the writing is by uh what's his name porn sack pish pichetto and uh a successful writer you know winning winning eisners and things like that but to me i i remember i had a problem after a few issues of his uh, good asian book too where the plot, the, the something with the writing went wrong. Um, it's already going wrong in the first issue here, so I don't think I'll pick up the second issue. Um, because I also am not that crazy about cute stories about cats and dogs saving the day. Uh, it is intriguing that the, um, the cats and dogs can talk to each other, but I don't think the humans hear them and understand them, but maybe they do. I don't know, are they enhanced? Or is this just kind of a fantasy of this is what they would be talking about? Um, but yeah, Jesse Lonigan's art is fantastic. Uh, can I buy a comic just for the art when I'm not wanting to read the story? That's an interesting question. This was a, I believe a four a $5 book, $4.99 book. So maybe, I don't know, I've got so many comics, even though I like Jesse Lonigan art. I'm not interested in the story whatsoever. It seems silly to buy the buy the comic. And then I kind of took the plunge on Superman. So I'm putting the the April was was at number nine. Man's Best Friend was at number seven, uh, at number eight, and I'm putting Superman at number seven. Um, <clears throat> it's written by Joshua Williamson. Art, I, I picked up two issues so that I could kind of have a little more to go by. Um, and I still, I was definitely in the middle of a story, but I think the story concludes with issue 12. And it might be a story that really has been running for 12 issues. Um, but so the artist is named uh, David Baldion. Oh, and Norn Rapmund uh, maybe did some inking. Huh, you can't really tell. But the art style kind of, it wasn't awful, but it just, you know, it didn't, really click with me and it had a i don't know what you call this style is it ma a manga influenced style or influenced by something else but it's not very um traditional superhero kind of style superman seems to be wearing and uh, yeah superman seems to be wearing different costumes all the time 
Um, there he is in kind of a Superman long coat. I don't know if he has a zoot suit or something. And there he is in kind of Superman armor. And then uh, he appears in a classic Superman costume there. And sometimes his face looks like like a kid's face. And other times he looks a bit more grown up. Let me see. I think when he's, uh, well, maybe he's not that grown up looking, but he seems more grown up looking when he's in his corporate setup. So there's a lot of stuff here I didn't know about. I could sort of parse it, but it also felt like, um, even though the art maybe is a little uh, manga influenced, the storytelling is actually, there was too much going on here for me. It's like, wham, you're hitting me with this idea and that idea and this one. Um, so and it, it, it wasn't, so I, th I thought a lot of the ideas were clever um, and maybe they would have hit me in a different way if I'd read the full 12 issue arc. Um, but it felt higgledy piggledy, just one thing on top of another. Um, in The pacing was weird in other words. Some of the best comics uh, or good comics tend to have a certain kind of pacing that unfolds in a good way. But anyway, I had no problem understanding it all. And, and maybe with different art, I would have uh, dug it even more. So I'm not sure if I'll read more Superman or not. Um, it seems like this story arc, in a lot of ways, is about Lex Luthor. And it feels like um, they are retconning Lex Luthor yet again. Um, from what I can tell here, into not like a, a selfish kind of person, but not quite so bad. And at one point, he was a science superhero in Metropolis. <laughs> um, I even got some vibes of like, um, uh, what was his name? That Tom Tomorrow? No. Damn it. I hate when I'm on camera and suddenly the Alan Moore story. Um, Oh, what was the name of that series about the science hero? Anyway, on to the next book. I'll think of it later. Um, next up at number six, about halfway through my pile, is Dawn Rubber Runner by Ram V. I just assumed when I bought it without looking inside, because it was a Ram V and I knew it involved giant mechs and giant monsters, uh, which is something I like a lot, that I would really like this comic. Um, and in fact, maybe I'm ranking it a little bit too high, still getting a little bit of a, a Ram V bonus. Um, but it the, it's, does nothing or very little to be different from any of the other giant mech comics. I've seen a ton of them um, over the past, I don't know, six years or so. Uh, I've, I've read about three or four of them, and I've seen others um, out there. Um, the art is kind of cool, but kind of confusing. And the colorist is Dave Stewart. And I'm surprised because I've read other uh, comics recently with fantastic coloring by Dave Stewart. But I feel like Dave Stewart kind of adds to the confusion of what's going on. There's a lot, maybe it's the uh, artist and not Dave Stewart. I don't know. There's a lot of these, uh, you know, dots. I forget what they're called. Um, ben Day dots or something. Um, I presume put in by the colorist, but maybe put in by the artist. And, and they tend to obscure things. But so in a comic that's about giant robots and monsters, I don't get a very clear picture of the giant robot. Like, this is one of the big reveals of the giant robot, and I can't quite tell what's going on there. And the colorist color definitely didn't help me. I guess the reason why the dots are over it there is because this is on a screen that these two characters down here are looking at. Um, but there's some vague sense that the giant robots fighting the monsters are is a kind of show business but also that the humans are losing the war in the long run against the monsters. Here's really the only clear shot we get of a monster, and that was kind of cool. Um, but, you know, it is one of these things where I'm like, maybe there's profound stuff here that Ram V is putting in that I am missing. Um, 
because some people always find him deep. There's a there's a section with the a robot fighting the monster, a, a couple of or a number of wordless pages, and I couldn't really follow the action of what was happening here. Um, and then at the end, there's kind of a twist, which maybe will in a future issue make a lot more sense. But the 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 twist which seems to involve either time travel or or one reality being two different realities competing with each other or something. Um, it, it wasn't super clear or compelling to me at this point. I'm definitely going to going to read some more. There's a lot of cool things about the art. And uh, I, I think this whole idea that if 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 there's a good writer out there that everything he does is going to be good and you're going to like it all, uh, is a false one. Um, you know, they, this writer can do no wrong kind of idea. So Ram V as just like anyone else can do wrong. <laughs> Writing is hard and it doesn't always come out well. Okay. Um, but maybe, you know, the second issue will change me because second issues changing me has happened before. Um, at number five, I put Elvira meets H.P. Lovecraft. And this is another one where I picked up the issue before, issue one, and so I read issue one and issue two, and it's a lot of fun. Um, it is kind of like the Superman. It is jam-packed, but in this case, jam-packed with jokes. It takes quite a while to read, and I at times had to, you know, reading headlong through could almost miss some of the jokes or not the jokes might not land. So you almost wish they had more space to space things out between jokes. But anyway, I would go back and, um, and uh, read a panel or two again. And then, and then really uh, the joke would sit it set in a lot of cheesy jokes, a lot of um, self-referential jokes and stuff like that. And I, to me, it's a lot of fun to have HP Lovecraft as a character the in two issues it becomes kind of clear that in every issue the same events are going to happen in a or similar events they're chasing after um getting the the true copy of the neocomicron i always forget how to pronounce that the neomicron <laughs> hp lovecraft's famous book and so each time they find a copy and then they fight with the bad guys and it turns out not to be the accurate copy. So I don't know how many issues this is, probably either four or six. So there are probably four or six copies that they'll be looking after. I, even though I rank this fairly high, I could live without reading it. I could buy it or not buy it. It would be fun if I did, but I kind of get the idea just from these two issues also. Then at number or I'm putting in The Bloody Dozen, A Tale of the Shrouded College, which I guess is going to be six issues long because they say they're, in the back matter, they say they're two-thirds of the way through. Um, we got some interesting twists and turns. I was, I'm kind of bought into this story at this point about these vampires uh, that are being freed by astronauts because the, uh, the uh, vampires had been uh, imprisoned in a satellite going around the sun. And now they're the vampires and the astronauts are kind of caught up in this war between two different sort of uh, magical groups, <laughs> the Shrouded College and another group, the Artifactors or the Architects or something like that. Um, the astronauts have been hired by the Shrouded College. So it's interesting. It's enjoyable. It's not profound. I mean, it's... It, it's wild and crazy, the whole setup, but it doesn't do as much with it as I had imagined it might. I don't know what it should have done, but mostly I think what, you know, keeps it down a little bit for me is the art. I'm not, I'm just not a fan of this art or of, you know, the coloring is not killing it in terms of like, I can see everything that's going on, but I'm not a fan of the coloring style either. So the last three, as sort of often happens, the last three were pretty close. I liked all of them quite a bit more. Like I might give most of those two and a half to three stars, and maybe the, now we're getting into the three and a half stars to maybe four stars. Um, 
range of comics. I keep talking about stars, so maybe I ought to start star ranking everything I read in these videos. So I've got um, The Infernals at number three. It's The Infernals number two. And um, it continues the story of the heirs of the Antichrist, because the Antichrist got cancer and is not going to be able to finish his mission. And um, adds in some new characters like the Antichrist's Christ's ex-wife and uh, a... Um, computer genius of some kind with a startup that's going to give knowledge to everybody in the world for free that um that the antichrist corporation wants to buy into um and that that all of that was intriguing to me so to me um the ante is upped with this story and it's becoming a bit richer and i i hope the story is not too short i'd really like this to run at least eight issues or so um, to get the full flavor of it, if not longer. Um, so I'm really enjoying this and it's got this cool painted art and an interesting thing at the back is the process we see of the hand drawn and hand painted, uh, one of the pages. Um, and I, I was just thinking the other day when looking on, uh, Instagram about these um, accusations of DC Comics using AI art and somebody on a Spawn cover using AI art, that artists now are going to want to really show people that they did this by hand, um, that that's going to become an important part of the life of an artist. Because um, some of the accused artists of using AI can claim they may have not used AI, they may have done it by hand. And I think we also, you know, we already have a lot of artists who are using programs to help them draw, like programs that that do wire dummies of characters in different positions and things like that. So I think that artists are going to want to emphasize the handmadeness of their art. <laughs> So, and I was glad, I, I'm glad to know, I'm glad to see that this is handmade. I'm, I'm happier with this art no, knowing that it was drawn on a piece of paper. I'm getting a text. I'm gonna text my daughter back live. Sorry about that. Um, in it, number two, beneath, beware the planet of the apes. This continues to be really fun. Um, the the um, Kira, the one of the main ape characters from the first three Planet of the Apes movies, makes a moral decision that I'm not sure she would make choose that way. But that's me being kind of picky. Uh, Overall, this is very fun. Uh, we have a cool representation, for instance, of one of the telepathic mutants uh, talking with the mute Nova in her mind and using the Wizard of Oz imagery um, to sort of, I don't know, create a mindscape that they talk within. I thought a lot of the art was pretty strong. Um, and uh and yeah the story continues to be fun there's only one more issue so i'm interested how they're going to wrap it all up we've now got uh a, a mutant city and an a gorilla ruled city neither of which were in the original planet of the apes battling each other sort of with with the, some of the characters from the planet of the apes like nova and kira and others um in the middle in the midst of it all so how is their memory of all this going to be erased? What, how is it going to um, be placed in the background? But anyway, really cool. Um, I hope they let uh, Mark Guggenheim write some more Planet of the Apes comics. That would be great. And in it, number one is m kind of my big shock because I read number one of uh, If You Find This, I'm Already Dead, which I think is a terrible title. And I think it's a terrible way to do covers with this kind of a ripped away image although here's the full image on the back so that's that's better um 
I wasn't going to get issue number two. And just on impulse, I did. Because uh, issue number one, I felt found very unsatisfying. And it kind of started out as what seemed to be a cool science fiction story. And then it turned into kind of what seemed like a dumb science fiction story. But with issue two, I'm sort of appreciating it as not your standard kind of science fiction where things make sense, but really more like a, I don't know, a heavy metal Mobius style science fiction world that's more dreamlike and poetic. And uh, I'm accepting it for what it is uh, now that I've gotten over the expectations that were falsely created by the beginning of the series. And I'm really enjoying our characters sort of voyage through this kind of bizarre and hellish world and uh, not trying to make it be so logical as I normally would with a science fiction background. And the art, the art and colors are really nice. Um, and it starts going into kind of a almost Jack Kirby inspired um, sort of inventiveness um, as as we travel through this world, which all seems to be underground. And there's a nice little just teaser thing right in the last page that definitely wants me to make read the next issue. I'm assuming it's going to be four issues because that seems to be what they do at Dark Horse. Um, at the back, they have some of the artist's sketches, which kind of add to that Kirby-esque sense. Because um, this one here is called Merkel the Mom. It says, Desaad figure, a real piece of shit. So like the character Desaad created by Kirby in the New Gods. Um, yeah, so I am really enjoying this now. That's cool how you. it looks like you're in a real notebook there. Um, again, making sure you don't think this was AI generated. Although you wouldn't look at this art and naturally think it's uh, AI generated, I don't think. Um, yeah, so this is expensive. Uh, if you don't mind the $8, <laughs> it's a really good comic, in my opinion. Anyway, I was really, I'm not, I don't want to tell other people what to buy to tell you the truth, but I was really happy reading this. So it kind of ended my giant stack of comics pretty happily. Uh, yeah, but I'm just still, will I be buying new comics six months from now? I'm not sure, but we'll see. We have to just continue forward and find out. I'll talk about comics some more with you all pretty soon. Bye-bye.